Let's turn our Bibles uh, this evening or this afternoon back to the Epistle to the Ephesians. And you. <laughs> Thank you. Been that kind of week. Yeah, that's that, that's the wrong one. Thank you for that. Galatians, not Ephesians. Uh, let's see here. There we go. It's going to sound much like Romans um, from a different angle, but uh, Paul in the Galatians epistle spent uh, a great deal of time defending his apostolic authority. Usually in his other epistles, he would just mention the fact he was an apostle. And I was asking earlier, was that something that happened that the other writers of the New Testament did, and I don't recall, I just can't recall this point, Did you don't think so, I have to check into it, but in fact, why don't you do that, look at uh, just briefly Peter's epistles, and the beginning of Peter's epistles, and the beginning of John's, because I don't really think that they made the emphasis of apostolic ministry as Paul did, because we know that Paul was always being uh, accosted, as it were, by the Judaizers and other false teachers who are trying to discredit him and discredit the ministry. So what what do you got? Oh, okay, cool. All right, good. So it was something that they, that was typical of the apostles to identify themselves um, as apostles when they, when they wrote their epistles. So, that's, okay, that's good. Thank you for that. But more for Paul, he went into extensive um, reasons, especially in the Galatian epistle, uh, why he did that. In fact, verse 1 is clear as we go into the actual text tonight. Not all, but some. Okay. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men or man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead not of men he was not an apostle of or by he wasn't an apostle for man okay in other words um, he wasn't owned by man and he was not an apostle by man in terms of being called so his message his ownership and his calling had nothing to do with man at all mankind period it was completely uh, a calling that had to do exclusively with Christ, Christ Jesus, and God the Father, who raised Christ from the dead. So he began to uh, defend his apostolic call by Christ and the Father. And as I said, he really takes the gloves off in this epistle, uh, perhaps as none other. Um, and why did he have to do this? He did it because, again, the Judaizers, uh, who continued to follow his trail, uh, were spreading lies and uh, innuendos in an attempt to destroy his character and, in the doing of it, to render his message useless to uh, the reader, which is exactly um, what they do. And not only that, but it was an attempt by the Judaizers to elevate themselves and their not another gospel gospel by saying that the message that Paul preached was a lie and uh, that it was not the gospel and should have been not heeded to. So remember, when you listen to a critic, that's the basic motive. And really, nothing's changed but the date. This is all the same thing. What they have to do is to get you to believe that the character of the one who's bringing the message is flawed by whatever it means. So you discredit the character of the message. You notice they never go after the message while Paul is there. They subvert the message when he's gone because they know that they couldn't, they couldn't challenge Paul. I mean, look what they did to, uh, to Stephen in Acts 7. I mean, they could not withstand the wisdom by which he spake, so their only recourse was to stone him to death. And the same thing was true of Paul in the book of Acts. Um, when Paul preached, uh, the Judaizers convinced the people to stone Paul to death. They couldn't, 
they couldn't delineate their message on the same level as Paul because there was no real message of, of salvation. So the only means that they could do was what they always done, just kill the messenger or persecute the messengers. They couldn't talk to Paul on the same level of understanding of truth because they didn't know it. And so they wanted it destroyed. And so what they would do is they would destroy the character of the man. And once you determine that the man's character is not credible, then you don't believe what he says. It's just the nature of people to do that. And it's a, it's a tactic that has been going on, well, far back as man. And I don't think it's going to change because I think people who are basically gullible are going to believe whatever they hear. And it's not in their nature to really investigate evidence. It's in their nature to believe a lie. And then they go, well, there must be some truth about it. Because look, it's, the, it's these guys that got fake credentials. They came from the, from the Jerusalem Council. We're going to see later. They didn't come from them at all. But, you know, if you were wise, you wouldn't listen to them. I mean, Paul was in their midst. The power of God was evident. They're saved. But primarily because of the ministry that Paul brought to them and how God used him to do it. And then they decided, no, um, they were they were treating Paul now as an enemy. This is how effective, and you must you must see this. This is how effective a cowardly critic can be in terms of trying to destroy the character of people. This is what they do, and, and nothing's changed. But it's not just that. There's a purpose in destroying the character of the man or men. They have to do that in order to bring their own alleged message to the front. They elevate themselves by destroying others. In fact, people love to hear gossip, and then they want to attach themselves to the gossiper to hear more and more lies. That's why gossip in and of itself is so dangerous. That's why we must be very careful about wanting to hear this stuff. It's, it's not good. It has effects and tentacles that reach out and ruin other lives. E you know, even family, work, home, play, whatever, the whole idea that, that gossip is something harmless is insane. You never know the effects of the lie that you spread, how that lie will affect that person and many other people that you never know. I mean, you never realize how a person who was favorable to the truth will now reject it because you destroyed the character of the man or woman who was giving that person the truth. You never know. I mean, what you were giving him in its, in its replacement, it was just a flat out lie. But you didn't think about that. And so Paul said, you know, Enough of this. Okay, we got We got to deal with this. So he pull up, pull up his sleeves, and um, he's he's taking off his gloves. It's time, or rather, put should I say, put on the gloves. He's, he's getting ready to duke it out. And why was that? Why is it that he's doing that here? And I love this about the scripture. It shows this wonderful, humble man. And yet, there are times where you have to get in the ring. It's ready. It's time. So why, why did he do that? Well, first of all, Paul's entrance into the apostolic ministry was not human, but divine. And he makes that clear over and over again. Okay. So to deny that is to call Paul, Christ, and God the Father all liars. There are some things worth fighting for. In fact, I wrote that in my commentary in 2 Corinthians. There are some things worth fighting for. Sometimes you have to defend who you are, because it's much more than just you. You know, if it's some personal thing, I don't like Harley because he likes, he doesn't like liver and he doesn't like this or that. And I think he's wrong because liver is good for you. I know his views on liver being a poison filter. It's just wrong. And I know my mama made, I'm still okay. It's fine. Eat all of you want. End of discussion. You don't bother me one bit. You can you can deny the criticism that the liver is a poison filter, even though that's exactly what it is. And you could deny it all you want, and you can eat all the liver of anything forever, and it don't mean nothing. I don't care. Well, Harley, he he. I don't like the 
the fact he goes to Planet Fitness and Crunch Gym, the only real gym is Gold's Gym. You know what? You want to pay that membership to lift the same dumbbell? Knock yourself out. And you want to go to the gym where all the stars are at? Fine. No problem. Have no problem with me with that. That's, that's, that's how you roll fine. There are plenty of stars I've seen when I was going to the gym in the 80s up there in Hollywood. And it wasn't goals. It was 24-hour fitness or whatever name was before that. It's fine. You know, everything's good. I didn't go to SC, so I went there to train. But that's fine. You know, you, you don't like the protein I drink? Fine. You know, with me, none of that matters. It, there's no there's no consequence to it. It's just a matter of you like something I don't like, and I like something you don't like, and that's fine. There's no there's no consequence about it. I don't like your opinion about the president. It's an opinion. It's fine. I don't like what you said about this. It's fine. It's no consequence to me. When you talk about the family, though. Now you getting so now you now you getting near that line where I gotta say something. When you start getting into the ministry that God has called me unto, the effects of that ministry is definitely not me and the local. It's everywhere. Oh yeah, we go. We gonna duke it out. Yeah, we gonna duke it out. It's not gonna be all the time, but there are times where, yeah, it's time to say something. Yeah. So in Paul's case, again, he makes it clear that his call into the apostolic ministry of Christ was not human. And to to actually deny, to call Paul a liar and question his apostolic call is to really question the Godhead who put him there. Yeah, you need to say something about that. This idea where you just sit there and say nothing, I don't see that. I don't see anywhere in scripture. That's that's not even there. That's that's you, you need to stop letting that that westernized culture and it always ebbs and flows and changes prevent you from being a believer and, and responding as a believer. You know. Suddenly these heathens want to teach you how to be humble at opportune times when they want to slam your your life, then they want to tell you how humble you need to be. Um I would just say stand back, get ready, because it's coming. The throwdown is coming, and it's going to hurt you too. Number two, a man's integrity is worth fighting for. Um, I would probably say that uh, a lot of men probably should defend themselves more as opposed to less. A lot of men I know who are are credible, who have great ministries in terms of their ability to reach and talk to people that God has called and gifted them that they, they wind up um, being stepped on and, and then they say, well, the Lord wants me to be quiet. And that's true. If God directs you to be quiet, you be quiet. But some men need to speak up because your integrity is worth fighting for. You know, there are times where you just have to say something. And there are times where you have to be quiet. But Paul doesn't address apostolic authority in all his epistles like he does here. But this one here in particular, he's really taken the people to task. And in a sense, he's really rebuking the Galatians as well. Because these Judaizers convinced them that Paul was not who he claimed to be. Number three, very important, liars must be exposed. I don't know where we get the impression we're not supposed to expose liars. That's, I don't know. I don't know what kind of Bible people are reading, but there's sometimes you got you to gotta expose them for who they are. And the Judaizers needed exposing for who they are, and he's going to take a long time to do it. He's going to tell everybody about these people. He's going to compare the true work of ministry that God had wrought with him to these nobodies who spent all that time with fake credentials, making up things and making up lies, discredit Paul and the gospel to elevate themselves with a, no, with a not another gospel gospel. Number four, and this is more important above all things, and I think number four, the eternal destiny of souls was at stake. That, to me, is the number one reason why sometimes you've got to get in the ring and duke it out. 
because what you have is a message and a, and a commission to teach things that have eternal consequence. You know, the, what I do and have done and God willing will continue to do is something I take very seriously because the eternal destiny of souls is at stake. This isn't some light thing with me. You know, what you see and what you hear and what you believe, <laughs> when you ask me, I'm going, I don't really care what you see and hear and believe and think because you are not in this person. You are not me. You don't have the, 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 the press of the call on my life. You don't know that. You can't know that. You have no idea what I'm doing. You have no idea what I feel. You have no idea what I'm thinking. I don't call it pressure. It's not pressure. It's the weight in the sense of responsibility of the calling. That's why if you heard a message from me from the beginning of ministry, 1977, until today, you would hear no difference except my ignorance was being exposed more than previously reported, and I'm hopefully getting more and more wise in the truth. So you would hear that. That would be something you would constantly hear. The ministry, is he's still teaching, he's still going through the Word, he's still expounding the Word, he's still doing what he... That's never changed. And it's not going to change, because what is a call, what does a commission command you to preach? What does a commission command you to do? You know, I told you before, I was invited to be on someone's political campaign. I said, uh, I said, I don't think stepping down from the pulpit is a wise idea. Kind of looked at me like I was crazy, you know, because in their mind, the pulpit is at the bottom rung of things and some political career where you speak articulate and blah, blah, blah. Like stepping down from the pulpit, that would be a step way down to be a politician next to pond scum, okay? I, I don't have any intention of stepping down to preach or to teach a message which has so little relevance to anyone's life here because no one really believes you anyway. Why would I, why would I think to do that? To step down and get into the, the gutter, the swamp with these people and to, to see firsthand the manipulation of people and the manipulation of your cohorts in, in politics around you that are as corrupt as you knew them to be before you decided to uh, to get into politics. Not, not going to do it. And the message of the, the gospel is far more important. The only thing that changes hearts, you know, giving people more money when they don't work is not going to help them. Change the hearts, you change their lives. Number five, the message of the gospel is so important that any deviation from it means that the saving impact is null and void. Stop. You want to destroy the gospel? Tweak it. That's why I said, and will keep saying, that much of what you hear is gospel is garbage. It's a not another gospel gospel. We'll see that in verses 6 and on. That it is another of a different kind of gospel that does not save. When Paul says that he is really shocked that they were so soon removed from the gospel to another, it's another of a different kind. In other words, it's another of a different kind of gospel than the only gospel. So it's a not another gospel gospel. There is no gospel, but they are being moved from that, being persuaded to move away from the only truth. So every time I see someone tweaking the gospel, all they're doing is diluting it. And in the dilution of it, the saving impact is null and void. You know, when you have to... <laughs> we have to dress up your dog to convince people it's a dog. There's something wrong with you. I never could figure out why people dress up their dogs in sweaters and pants and hats. To me, that's craziness. What are you, what are you doing? He's a dog for crying out loud. 
What are you trying to make him to be? It's a dog. Let the dog be a dog. And we 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 don't want the we want the dog to we want people to oh he's so cute. He looks just like part of the family. He's not. He's a dog. No dog is part of your family. You didn't give birth to that dog. It's not your child. There's no DNA of you and that dog. I wish you care more for human beings than you do for your pets. Oops, did he say that? Yeah, I said it. So what happens, we take a gospel and we, we dress it up. And you mess it up. We dress up our gospel. You just don't believe, as we'll see in Romans chapter 1, that the gospel of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Then that believe that just that simple gospel message. When you see it preached by the apostles, the book of Acts, you don't see them doing anything around the gospel. There's no music in the background. There's no altar calls, whatever that nonsense. There's no, there's no people jumping up and down. There's no super duper well-known speakers. There's only a, a fisherman that denied Christ, who's now filled with the Holy Spirit, who's empowered, and who has the courage to teach the truth now. And these other nobodies, these hayseeds from everywhere, they're not any different than who they were before they all forsook Jesus and fled. They're still the same nobodies. The only difference is now they're empowered by the Spirit of God. But people saw them the same way. Well, that's Peter. Didn't he deny the Lord? Yeah, but not anymore. They didn't treat them as supermen. They just they just looked at them, what the world is going on? What's happening? Now they are empowered by God to do the things that only God could do through them. But people start tweaking the gospel. I've heard this for years. Well, they just can't accept the message like that. Well, then they can't be saved. And neither could you for suggesting such a thing. If you don't believe that the simple proclamation of the gospel is sufficient to save someone, you're not saved simply because you just denied what God said. Why should I believe that your gospel saved you when you're denying the only gospel? That's the only means of saving people. If you don't believe it for somebody else, why should I believe it for you? I don't. Because those who know the gospel go, it's the power of God unto salvation to them that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile or to the Greek. We don't tweak the gospel. We just proclaim it. It's up to the hearer to believe it. When you see how it's preached in the book of Acts, there's no fanfare. There's no distractions to it. These false teachers told Galatian believers that Paul failed to give them the complete requirements for salvation. In simple terms, Paul and his message were to be discredited. Paul did not tell you the gospel. We're here to tell you the gospel. It's not simply to believe in Christ. You have to perform something. Paul, def we'll get back to that too. Paul defended his qualifications as an apostle against the attacks of the Judaizers. He was called to be an apostle by God, and the gospel of grace he preached came from God, independent of the Jerusalem apostles. In fact, even they approved of both. Eventually, they approved of the fact that Paul was an apostle and that his gospel came from Christ, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they eventually... As we saw this morning, they in chapter 2, uh, well, Galatians is a reference, they approved the both, that he was an apostle, that his message was the same message that they preached, that he was called by the same Christ that, that called them. And they gave him and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. And said, keep doing what you're doing to the Gentiles. Paul said... He says, Paul, an apostle. The word apostle, as we saw, means a delegate or a messenger, one sent forth with orders from Christ. 
His calling again was unique from the call of the original 12 apostles, as we will see because he was called by the resurrected Christ. Paul declared that his apostleship, his calling was not of men, meaning the source of his calling and his sending, but through Christ and God the Father that raised him from the dead. So his call into the apostolic ministry had zero to do with mankind. None. Very important that you understand that. Zero. The source of his apostleship was from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead. Very important. The fact was that not one single Judaizer could make the claim that Paul made. The way that the Judaizers were behaving, it's, it's almost clear that there may have been... I look at that. I have to look even tighter in the text of the book itself or these epistles. I would be under the impression that the Judaizers may have given the people the impression they were apostles. And I'll tell you why. Because again, when Paul deals with the fact that um, these men were not sent by Jerusalem, by the Jews in Jerusalem, by Jerusalem Council, they had letters, letters of authority. I don't know what those letters were, but I would not be surprised because I don't put anything past anyone who's false um, that those fake letters were letters declaring that these or some of these might have been apostles, that they spoke in behalf of the apostles um, and other apostles within Jerusalem. I wouldn't put it past them. I don't put anything past false teachers. I mean, they're calling themselves gods now. So, <laughs> and many of them call themselves apostles. So why would it be any different back in that day? But they were not apostles. They had no divine call from Christ, nor God the Father. Their message was not from God because it was not the gospel. The Judaizers had nothing. That's the difference. The difference between Paul and the Judaizers was that Paul had the true gospel, taught the true gospel. That's why you have a Galatian church, or the church is, as it were, and the fact that the Judaizers have nothing. There's no epistle written to the Judaizers. There's no epistle written from the Judaizers. They got nothing. All they did was hound Paul and criticize. They have no body of work, no legitimate followers to show for whatever they were doing. And watch your critics carefully, because you'll notice how they almost inevitably uh, mirror the behavior of the Judaizers to some degree. They go behind discrediting the people that are actually doing the work. They have no work. They create their own authority, which is not attached to any local church, mind you. Now, that's a real, real danger. That's why anyone's ever heard me over the years, I have always had problems with parachurch, whatever that nonsense is, because there's no such thing in the Bible. Parachurch ministries are usually detached from the church. They, Some people actually say, well, they, they, help, they don't help the church. They're all gunslingers, and they go out on their own. They create their own works, uh, never attached to anyone. And inevitably, many of them wind up being cultic. Or start veering off with false doctrine. Because they're not attached to local church. Show me in the Bible where any of the apostles, any ministry, any missionary, any anybody was detached from the local church. Show me. And then when you do that, show me the models today that are being used uh, in the scripture. These models that we use, show me where their origins are in scripture. No one ever was detached from the church, the local churches. They didn't start doing things on their own. I've always had a problem with parachurch, what it's so-called parachurch ministry, because I'm, I'm well, where's that in the Bible? I always ask a simple question, where's the stuff in the Bible? No one wants to answer that question because they know it's not there and they're irritated that you would ask that question. The fact is, everyone should be asking that question. The Judaizers had nothing, no ministry, no works, no body of work 
their sole function was to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all they did. There was not and is nothing good about a message that does not liberate the hearers, salvifically speaking. Worse than that, the message of the Judaizers had a condemning effect rather than a saving effect. Uh, if you listen to the message of the Judaizers and you follow them, it's, it's condemnatory. I mean, to subject the hearers under Mosaic system is to subject them under death. If you have freedom in Christ, you are truly free. And if you have everything you need in Christ, you don't need anything. You don't need any kind of additive to Christ. We'll get to that later. Paul and the apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Uh, the reference by Paul to the resurrection of Christ was no accident. Uh, it was intended to remind the readers that Paul did not back down from the essential message of the gospel, that being the resurrection of Christ. In the book of Acts, the apostles preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the means, the sole means of salvation. Without the resurrection, you, you have no salvation possible. It's not possible. The potential believers had to believe the resurrection if they were going to be saved. And this is the good news, the gospel, nothing else is. And anything we tell people instead of the resurrection of Christ is a not another gospel gospel and has no more saving effect on the life of the hearer than Judaism did for the Jews or the Gentiles. That's why you have to be careful about what you're listening to. Very much so. They preached the resurrection. We spent plenty of time in the book of Acts, but we're going to spend plenty of time going back, back to the future. Acts 3, 13 through 20. Yes, we are. We're going to do some reading. A lot of reading coming up. Those that don't like to read scripture, too bad. This is all about what saved the scripture, not what saved the opinion. Acts 3, verse 13. The God, of our, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But he denied the Holy One and just and desired a murder to be granted unto you and kill the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him had given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, remember that, that Christ should suffer, he had so fulfilled. Okay, so now what's the solution? Repent ye therefore and be converted. That's a, a constant message in Acts. It's not what we teach today, but that's the model we have. Repent ye, repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come uh, from the presence of the Lord, and, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So God glorified Christ which means, of course, Jesus said, glorify thou me with the glory I had before with you in John 17. And how did God glorify Christ? He raised him from the dead. Acts 3, 26, same chapter. Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Isn't that marvelous that God raised up Jesus to bless the Jews, the Jewish audience that heard that? And how would the resurrection of Christ bless the Jewish hearers in turning away every one of you from his iniquities? The message was to repent. It sure was to repent and be converted. 
unto you first, unto you Jews, God having raised up the Son, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities or from his iniquities. It's a blessing. Without the resurrection, none that's possible. Acts 4. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That's what got them riled, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide, howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. A number of the men was about 5,000. They preached the resurrection of Christ. Wow. How about Acts 17? Beginning at verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what would this babbler say? I love that. Others, some, he seemed to be a set of forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear of some new thing. Go down to verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God it is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That message never changed. Because he had appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believe, among which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. They all preached the resurrection, some mocked, most mocked, some believed. So it's clear to see in the text that the importance of the resurrection could not be overstated. Because without a resurrected Christ, there is no sacrifice. See, if Christ is the penal sacrifice for man, all right, and he is the substitutionary, the penal substitutionary sacrifice for man, but he doesn't resurrect from the dead, game over. You just have another man in the grave. He died for nothing. That's why the importance of the resurrection cannot be overstated. Without a resurrection, you have nothing. You just have a man that died, another man just like you, among men. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We're going to deal with that when we get there. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, or unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So we can easily see right here, clearly, how important the resurrection was. It was the resurrection that was preached, not reforming the character, not religion, not external liturgical religion, not liturgy, not humming, hawing, mooning, oh, no, none of that junk. 
not candles, smoke, incense. It was all about Christ and his resurrection, which was the message which was preached. And until we tell people the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have not given any gospel to anyone. Zero. You taught them nothing that's going to save them. If there's no resurrection, it doesn't matter what you teach them, what you give them. It's not a gospel. Paul the apostle, or an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. That's plural, very important. So this is a circular letter. Grace, so, so the effects of the Judaizers did not affect one church. It affected all the churches. These Judaizers were busy men, busy doing the wrong thing. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. That's penal substitution right there. He gave himself for our sins. The very God that demanded the sacrifice became the sacrifice in Christ. God demanded a perfect sacrifice and then became that same sacrifice in his son. He gave us the sacrifice. Incredible. That he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So verse 1, we clearly see Paul referenced uh, the resurrection. In verse 4, he made reference to the sacrifice of Christ. So he reiterated this truth because he wanted to remind his readers that the entire message of salvation rest on the work of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's it. The entire work, the entire work of salvation rests upon Christ and the resurrection, his penal substitutionary death and the resurrection. That's it. Death, burial, and resurrection. The entire message of salvation rests solely upon the work of Christ. That's it. Nothing else. He gave himself, Christ gave himself for our sins. There was absolutely no reason apart from grace that Christ died as man's sacrifice. None. None. Nope. No reason. There was no reason apart from the grace of God that Christ would die. He didn't sin, couldn't sin, yet the sins of the whole world were placed on him at the crucifixion. The greatest act of love and the greatest demonstration of God's hatred to sinfulness was all placed upon Christ, was seen at that, at that cross. The greatest act of love. People talk about love. They don't only think about any love. The Bible said this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son to die for us. What is love is what God did in behalf of people that didn't deserve anything. The sins of the whole world were placed on Christ, the crucifixion that was done because God's love and mercy was revealed to man not of any merit. There was no merit. Man didn't do anything to move God to give his son. Period. Nothing. There was nothing man did to deserve the mercies of God. You, you don't deserve mercy. You, you don't earn mercy. You, you, you don't earn a gift. I mean, someone gives you a gift, it's a gift. The gift of God is salvation through Christ. You don't earn that. If someone walked up to you and gave you a gift, then it's freely given. You didn't do anything. There was nothing in man that caused God to give his son other than grace. Well, why are you making such an emphasis about this? Well, Simply stated, 
to mix Judaism or any other work to supplement one's salvation was and is to say that the work of Christ for salvation, all of his sufferings, the, the death, the horrific death he experienced was incomplete. And if it's incomplete, then it's useless. If the life and the suffering and the the death of Christ, the penal substitutionary work of Christ and his resurrection are not the complete means of salvation, then it is no means of salvation. And if you have to do a work, then what you're saying is all of what God has done through Christ is not enough. Do you realize that's what many people are actually saying? That this is what they're declaring, that the work of Christ is not enough, that you have to do something else. You have to obey tenets of the Mosaic system, or you have to be baptized, or you have to speak in what, you have to do all these things. You have to be in the church. You have to, all this stuff. A works righteousness, including any hybrid or fusion mix of works and grace, is to declare plainly that the work of Christ was incomplete. And this is blasphemy to declare that. I mean, it is unconscionable that a person could actually believe and then act upon such a deception that there is something they could actually do to add to this great work of God. That there is something that they can actually offer to improve upon the grace of God. That the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ, that God would send his son as, as a penal substitution for man's sin, to, that, that, that's, that's not enough that a human being has to complete this? When will this madness end? It'll end when Jesus comes. But you can add to this wonderful, marvelous work of God some human, notorious service of work. I mean, the pride and the arrogance that that would and does come from the heart of one who believes that he or she could do anything to assist the great work of redemption that Christ wrought through the resurrection is pompous nonsense. And people who often do that are so puffed up. They boast in their works and their trinkets and their whatever. And Christ is not sufficient. They always got to add something. And as I said, you add this much, it's too much. I mean, it's horrific nonsense to think that you could do something. Wow. I mean, Paul's going to really launch strong against those who attempt to cheapen the grace of God through some useless and ridiculous man-made supplement to the work of Christ. I mean, Paul says, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any of the gospel to you, then that which you already preach, let him be damned. That's what a curse means. You think that's not serious with Paul? He's saying, and this is important, even if we who brought you the true gospel, came back and gave you another, let us be damned too. That's how serious it was. <laughs> let him be accursed. Wow. We'll get there. We're, we're, we're just about there. We'll do it today, but we'll be my little bit. Hmm. Paul went on to say that the work of salvation was instigated by God, and because of that, he has been glorified forever. 
you didn't instigate the work of God. And if you recognize that God instigated his work in you, uh, he didn't let you finish it. Okay? He who had begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. The work started by God is going to be completed. It doesn't require you to finish it. He's going to complete the work. So what do you what do I do with this? Well, you yield to him. That's all you do. Stop you. There is no you. You are the problem. You keep getting in the way of everything. Remember, there's a glitch. Stop looking for sources outside of your own life. That's where the problem is. The problem of this, the problem of that, the problem of whatever is a problem with you and me getting in the way of what God has already done to us. We don't want to yield. That's where the problems come. We try to make these things so many other ways. So many, There is no other issues. This is so simple. The entire work of saving faith is the outpouring of the triad of the blessing of God, blessing, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Right after that, right after Paul sent his greetings and deals with his apostleship, part one, that is, he went right into the reason for the epistle immediately. I marvel, verse 6, that you are so soon removed from the from him that called you, which would be Christ. Remember, he, he talks about how he was called. Then he says, the same Christ that called me called you. And that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another of a different kind I'm just translating the Greek word for another. You either have Allah or heteros. Allah means the other of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. So this is a heteros, another of a different kind. It's not the same. It's not even similar. It's just not the same. Another gospel. Paul said, I, I'm astonished. When he says, I marvel, it's like, uh, what are you for? Re I, I'm, I'm, I can't believe this. He says, I'm amazed that you are all so <clears throat> quickly falling away or deserting from Christ. Remove means to fall away, means to desert. Who called you with a divine calling, a calling of race, calling of freedom, salvific call unto another or different gospel. I'm shocked. I find it that uh, what was true in Paul's case is true in many cases today, how easy people are deceived. It's incredible how easily many people are deceived. Now, you look at the Thessalonian church, of course, they were like rock solid. And they were a young church. I mean, six months old, and they were getting hammered. And Paul was so worried about them, he sent to find out how they're doing. Where he came back to Paul, they're fine. In fact, not only are they fine, but they become models for all churches. So Paul began to praise them. Here you got the Galatians, the exact opposite. They had the same truth, and they're a bunch of knuckleheads. He says, I'm shocked. Now, the gospel has two shades of meaning as we see both the actual message on the lips of Jesus about the reign of God, that's Mark uh, 114, and it is the story told about Jesus after his death and resurrection, that's Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. In each case, gospel refers to the work which God alone initiates and completes. Stop, 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 stop. You're going to hear me say this and have been saying it forever. The gospel refers to the work which God alone initiates and completes. All this stuff by man trying to appeal to flesh and get people to come down, it has been the ruin of the church. Oh my goodness, it has. 
how many people have come down the aisles repeatedly, the same people, and people not repeatedly, they just come down aisles and they say things, and, and next thing you know, they never come back to the church, they have nothing to do with the church. And what we have to do is create new false doctrines, which aren't new, to explain away why these people fell away, and yet they retain their Christian faith. And I'm going like, uh, they're not. <laughs> That's where you had four spiritual laws nonsense and a carnal Christian nonsense. No one taught that. That's plain, low-down heresy, demonic nonsense. And the model had, the, you know, Christ was off the throne, there was a heathen, and you had the Christian who Christ is off the throne, but he's not a heathen. It's, where is that? Yeah, where, where's that model? Uh, in a demon's head. That's where it is. That's nowhere taught in Scripture. None of that is. That, that was, that was uh, Bill Bright's attempt to come along and try to respond to the massive failures of, of, the, uh, of his alleged parachurch work and massive failures within the professed church of people making professions, and yet they're, they're gone. So we have to have an answer. So let's not go to the actual Bible and say there were never of us, like John said in his first epistle. Oh, no, that would be too right. We have to create this whole fake system of belief where we can make unbelievers believers. No, they're not. Because if you're trying and forcing people to make professions and make confessions and what have you, looks like you're initiating the work to me. I am forever grateful that there wasn't a human being a million miles where I was when I got saved. That God initiated the work in my life and he has and will complete it. I am so thankful that I was not polluted by the so-called church. That didn't take any of that stuff. I had no background in church when I was saved. Thank God that he alone initiated and will complete the work which he began. Inasmuch as God has chosen to bring about the world's reconciliation in this one particular way, there is only one gospel. Furthermore, since God is the one working through the saving activity of Jesus, God is also the author of it. There is no other gospel. None. None. All these adjectives, black gospel, white gospel, is no gospel. And everyone having their own individual nomenclature attached to what they consider the gospel is no gospel. The gospel is God's message to humanity, not the reverse. Only God calls and commissions the messengers of this good news. And in addition, only God gives the messengers the message they are to make known. In simpler terms, we have no right to preach our own message. Since we are commissioned by God, we are told, as Paul told Timothy, to please the one who has chosen us to be a soldier. I don't have any other message to preach. There is no other gospel except the one that God has given. And he has commissioned those of us who he has called to preach that message. So I ask you in closing, what does the calling command you to teach? What does a calling command you to do? What does a calling command you to proclaim? Does it command you to be a, a spokesman for politics? No. Does it command you to get your social network pages and make yourself to be the new Judaizer? No. Does it call for you to elevate yourself into this mystical puffed upness in your own head? destroying other people's legitimate works, hindering the work that God is actually doing by your stupidity and your jealousy and your pettiness? 
when you try to elevate yourself, make yourself look some, like somebody, when you have nothing behind you but air, nothing to show for it, no foundation, no connection to Christ or the church, zero. Is that okay by you? And you got a few dupe followers following you, and you think that's that's from God? You think that's part of the calling, the commission, part of the gospel? No. Therefore, the proclamation of the good news is the continuation of the work which God began in Christ. That that's it. And we're we're going to deal more of this next time. God willing, as we continue in verse six next Sunday. Lord, again, thank you for the gospel. The gospel alone that saves. The gospel which, if believed, is the great work of salvation to the, to the heart and life of the man or woman, boy or girl who believes. That's the power of God to save. It's the power of you to save, not man. All who believe. And we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you so much for this for this powerful message, this saving message. And ours is to proclaim it. The potential believer is to believe it and he will be one, a real genuine child of God. We are to defend that. We are to defend the faith. Never waver, never change. Bless the bread and cup this evening, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.